All right, open your Bibles. Who's got your Bible? Say me. Let me see it. All right, there they are. Good, 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 good. Open it to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Last week, we, we discussed the importance of salvation. It was a message actually on salvation, just um, what salvation is and what it is not and what salvation uh, opens a door unto. Obviously, salvation is the grace of God, the gift of God offered to humanity for the forgiveness of sins, but also... Um, salvation opens a door, according to Jesus, to a life that you can live on earth that you previously could not live on earth. So Jesus said, I am the door. One of the I am statements that Jesus said is, I am the door, I am the gate. Not only do you need to walk through Jesus to get to heaven, but there is a door that Jesus opens on earth for you to live on earth in a different manner. Jesus is offering you a life on earth that you can't even fathom, that you can't even imagine. Now, the Apostle Paul, who wrote about two-thirds of your New Testament, is trying to communicate this truth to uh, some new believers in the church of Ephesus. So in Ephesians chapter 1, he is, uh, he's excited, he loves this church, he's praying for the new believers, and he specifically prays something that I believe God is praying over every single one of us. So let's read it really quick. I'll tell you what I think this means in terms of where we are today and where God wants to take us. And then I'll show you some things that you can do to actually embrace this way of living. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 says, I keep asking that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Who wants to know God better? Anybody want to know God better? So this is what Paul is saying. All right, you've been saved, but I want God to now give you his spirit, the Holy Spirit, so that you can know him better. I want your eyes, the eyes of your heart, not just your physical eyes, but I want the eyes of your heart to be enlightened. I want your soul to come alive. I want you to see from the inside who God is so that you can not only know him, but also know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And he goes on to say, and his great power, his great power to those who believe, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So I want you to know him, be in a relationship with him, and as you get close to him, here's what's going to happen. He's going to start dropping revelation in your mind about who he is and who you are and what he's called you to and the new possibilities that are now in your life that once weren't there. He's going to show you the glorious riches that he wants to deposit in your life. And these are kingdom riches. These are gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are abilities in Christ Jesus. There is a way of living that he is calling you into. And this way of living is not a life of defeat. It's, it's not a life where we receive a golden ticket and then suffer our way into heaven. We're not, we're not living a life. Paul doesn't model this. Jesus doesn't model this. The early church doesn't model, say a prayer, live a normal life, one day get to heaven. It's not biblical. Is there suffering in this life? Of course there is. Is there tragedy in this life? Of course there is. But in the midst of struggles, in the midst of walking through valleys, I can still live a victorious life in Jesus Christ. Jesus walked through valleys. He walked through difficulties, but never, never was he defeated. Not once. And you might say, brother, lots of passion up there today. I get it. But he was Jesus, and I'm not Jesus. Well, yes. Never should anyone who is in Christ claim to be Christ. There's a fine line, in my opinion, between acknowledging the presence of God in you without going as far to say that you are essentially God. And there are some who go to that extreme. Well, we're all essentially gods now because of the power of Jesus. No, you're not. When we get to heaven, I will not be worshiping you. I promise. <laughs> yes? Every knee shall bow, every shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and no one else. Nobody's going to be worshiping anybody other than Jesus. And listen, like even now, 
There's only one person we should be praying to, and he's seated on the throne. I don't know if I should go. Okay, I will. I've led a lot of Catholic brothers and sisters to Jesus recently. And I'm having to convince them that you don't have to pray to people who aren't listening. Mary is not listening. Mary's dead. She's resurrected. She's with Christ. We don't pray. Like nowhere in Scripture can you find this stuff. You, you know what talking to dead people is called? Necromancy. I pray to one person in his name. Is God through Jesus Christ. Like, listen, if there's nothing Mary, Peter, Thomas, any disciple, any apostle can do for me that Jesus Christ can. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus made this simple for us. You don't need a playbook. You know, you don't have to go to your wrist arm to say, all right, I've got this going on in my life. Who do I need to pray to? Easy, Jesus. I don't even know why I said that, but I'm just saying, listen. He's opening a life of communication. He's, he says, he's, listen, he said, because of what I've done, you can come boldly to the throne room. Like, I don't have to go to the switchboard to figure out who I need to talk to today. I'm just going to step right into the throne room and start talking to God, all right? It's really simple. It's really easy. But we've made it really confusing. We've, we've made this whole life of faith about things that Jesus never intended. And he wants you to live in victory. What I'm going to talk to you today about is essentially this victorious life that I think comes by means of prophetic understanding, okay? The understanding of the prophetic gift of God that he has given you. When, when the Holy Spirit fell in Acts chapter 2, Peter said something very, very important. He said, this is what Joel talked about. And now, because of what God has done, because of what Jesus has done, the spirit of prophecy is now on everyone who believes. The spirit of prophecy, sons, daughters, men, women, young, old, all shall prophesy. We hear that and we think, what does that mean? Is that a person that stands up and says, I have a word from the Lord. Thus saith God Almighty. They change their voice a little bit. God has given me a word. <laughs> if anybody changes their voice when they talk, you are red flag. All right, all right. <laughs> Don't have to change your voice. No, no, no. What does that mean? It just means that now, because of what Christ has accomplished, all have the ability to hear God's voice and to speak it, sometimes to others, most of the time, speak it back to yourself. Remind yourself, this is what God is saying. This is what God is declaring. And it gives you an opportunity to hear God and obey God. Hear God and obey God. So no longer are we under old covenant restraints where we had to go through people, we had to go through priests, we had to go through prophets to get and receive words from God. No, now because of Christ, I've been given this prophetic anointing where I can relate to God every single day. This is the key to victory, by the way. This is the key to victory, is having God's voice in your life. So Paul says, I want you to have this because I've experienced it. I know others who have experienced that I want you to know God fully and to live this victorious Christian life. All right, what might this life look like? Let's ask Jesus what the victorious Christian life looks like. Turn in your Bibles now to Mark chapter 16. I'm going to paint a picture for what Jesus intended for you and then hopefully give you a pretty simple pathway to get it. Does that sound okay? Okay. Mark chapter 16. going to put one thing to rest that is, uh, who, who, who of you have a Bible where this portion is italicized? It's in italics, yeah? Does that make sense? Is that what it's called when it's sideways? Okay, yeah, yeah. All right, and some of you may have an asterisk next to this passage of Scripture, all right? And if you read that, if you have some commentary in your Bible, it'll say something like, uh, uh, this portion of Scripture is sometimes not included in early manuscripts. Um, which is accurate. Some of the earliest manuscripts don't have it. Now, some of the later manuscripts that are the most accurate we've ever found do include it. And also the early fathers 
included this in their teaching. The early church practiced this in their faith. So if you want to disqualify this passage of Scripture uh, due to it not being in some of the early Spanish, you can do that, but I can show you 14 other passages of Scripture that say the exact same thing. Okay? So it's, it's, not, it's not really even a debate, okay? But I'm just telling you this because you're a spirit-filled church. We're charismatic in what we believe in, in that. We believe that all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are today. God wants to continue doing these things until he returns. But if you ever come across somebody who says, well, I bet he quoted uh, old Matthew 16 to you, just be ready to ignore them. All right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but I ignore them because I've seen too much at this point. You can't, you can't tell me that God doesn't heal today. You may have convinced me of that about 10 years ago, but I've seen too many people healed today. You can't, you can't tell me that God doesn't cast out devils today. I've, I've seen too many come out of people. You, you can't tell me that God doesn't perform miracle signs and wonders today. I've seen too many. So, so if you're trying to convince me otherwise, you're too late. I've seen too much, and I know it's not the devil doing it. It's the Lord. First time I went to India, uh, a woman with white cataracts on her eyes right in front of me. She got saved, and then she said, can this Jesus heal my eyes? And I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I had zero faith. I had zero faith. I was a pastor at the time. I had zero faith. And the, before I could say anything else that would discredit me, the Indian pastor grabbed my hand, put it on her eyes, and said, he can heal, and he will right now. I was like, oh, no, here we go. <laughs> and he starts praying something in Hindi or whatever their language was, and I'm sitting there thinking, how am I going to explain to this woman and this whole village now who has gathered why God didn't heal this lady? I had zero faith. And uh, he said some stuff, and I was just like, yeah, do that, God. Yeah, yeah, do that, Lord. Ooh, that too, sounds good. Take my hand off, and she's looking at me with eyes clear, just like yours and mine. And she said, the Jesus healed my eyes. And, I was, and I'm sitting there looking. The, most, the person who was in most disbelief and shock was me. And I knew at that moment, all right, I can't unsee this. Now I've got to do something with it. Yes? When you see a miracle, you now have a responsibility to steward it. In your own heart. And with other people, because, you know, that's a seed that was put in that the enemy's going to come and want to steal, yeah. kind of rob you from. So this was, getting back to the topic, this, the, the life that we are to live is not the normal Christian life. Like, I hate that phrase. I just want to live a normal Christian life. Like, those words, those are oxymoron. They do not go together. There is no normal Christian life. See if this sounds normal. Mark chapter 16. He said to them, go in all to the world and preach the gospel to all of creation. Just a normal life. Whoever believes and baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Raise your hand if you believe. Do you believe in Jesus? Okay. Most of the room. Good. Good. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and they will drink deadly poison, and it will not hurt them. All right, ushers, this is your cue. <laughs> Bring the buckets with lids on them that we have stored in the back. If you hear a rattle, don't be alarmed. Does that mean that we need to handle some snakes? Please say no. Yeah. If you look at the Greek there, what is, what is he referring to? He's referring to darkness. The, the devil himself was referred to as a snake. Demons, scorpions, snakes. He's, what he's saying here is on your pursuit to advance the kingdom, some snakes are going to get in the way. Just know that even if one gets close enough to bite you, the poison won't affect you. Yeah. Like it's not going to affect you. Yeah. Step on it. Squish it. Even if it gets close enough to bite Fret not. They will place their hands on the sick people and they'll get well. And after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taking up to heaven. 
And the disciples sat down and did nothing and waited for him to come back. The disciples got together and built a building where they gathered once a week, sang some songs, did some Bible studies, The disciples kept their faith to themselves. The disciples lived a normal earthly life. The disciples went and got jobs to help them achieve their earthly dreams. The disciples blended into society and culture. The, the disciples began to talk like everyone else. The disciples struggled. Like the rest of the pagans who did not know the Lord. The disciples entered into broken relationships. The disciples got the mess beat out of them by the devil on a daily basis. The disciples were taken off guard at every turn. The disciples were fearful of sickness and disease in anything that was coming against them. And the only signs that they saw were the ones on the roads that they traveled. Does this say any of that? The disciples went out and pre guess what? They believed him. They took him at his word. They didn't form other doctrines to make them comfortable with their disbelief. They didn't have to form another doctrine that goes something like, well, at some point in time, God's going to stop doing these things. Doctrines that excuse apathy and disobedience to the Lord's commands. Is this too much? This is the Bible, folks. The Bible. Well, I was taught, I don't care what you were taught. You have a responsibility to be a good Berean, to hold whatever voice you're hearing to the scriptures. Like if it doesn't align with the scriptures, there's a good possibility that it's false. Like you got to work hard to not believe that this is Jesus' intent for your life. You've got to take some scriptures out of context and you've got to believe some things that aren't in the narrative. Don't send me an email. <laughs> Jesus did not save me. He did not save you to live in defeat. And he did not. Here's the key. He did not save you for you to live in in response and reaction to the devil every day. This is how most Christians live. We live with an awareness of the devil in his activities. And we live in response to those things. And this is even how we pray. We see crisis and we begin to pray. Oh God, look at what the devil's doing. Oh God, that marriage over. Oh God, look. Oh, financial issue. Whoa, look at the nation. Whoa, election year coming. Whoa, we're, we're, we're seeing the devil's activity. And this, we're responding to the devil and telling the Lord like he needs to know. And our whole life is on the defensive. We have a lot of defense, but we have no offense. We're like Alabama and Auburn. We have a little bit of defense, no offense. We got defense, and we're all about defense. And, and oh, here comes another arrow. Whoa, whoa, look at that, Lord. I need a bigger shield. Here comes another, here comes another missile, and here comes this. And they're attacking me. And we'll even measure the maturity of our faith by the amount of attacks that are coming our way. We'll say things like, wow, I must be really advancing. I must be really mature because the devil's attacking me. No, probably you've made a lot of bad decisions. Just to be honest, Jesus never said measure the level of your maturity and faith by the amount of tax that are coming against you. We don't measure our maturity by the devil's activity in our life. We measure our maturity by God's activity in our life. Like what is God doing in your life? Have you, are you hearing his voice? Jesus didn't pray in reaction to the devil. You don't see Jesus coming before the Father and saying, whoa, it's getting thick down here. Really feeling a lot of pressure. No, he's, he's, he's actually, think about this. Jesus in his prayer time is getting ahead of a lot of stuff. 
Like the father's dropping information. How do you think he knew to avoid certain things and avoid certain cities and go different ways? They would be walking to Samaria and Jesus would say, pivot. We're turning right and we're going to go about 14 miles out of the way through this region. And the disciples were like, why? That's not the quickest way to get there. Siri has told us clearly that the quickest way from point A to point B is to go this route. Why did Jesus make these decisions? Because the Father had either told him in advance or told him in the moment, there's a detour that I want you to take, but it's not really a detour. It's a pathway to a colony of lepers getting cleansed and saved and healed and delivered. And this is the assignment that I have for you. So he's not praying in response to the devil's activity. No, no. He's seeking the Lord's in guidance and information for his life. The reason that we often live, say this, the reason that we often live in response to the devil and often beat up is because we're not seeking God for revelation and information. We're seeking him for a hanky. Feel sorry for me, God. Help me, God. Pull me out of this, God. He is compassionate and he does want to help you. But guess what? He wants to help you by showing you that you can actually get ahead of a lot of this garbage. Like it's often when I'm spending time with the Lord and all of a sudden he'll, he'll drop a warning on me. Very specific sometimes. Like don't go to the gym today. Okay. Like no gym. Different gym. Sometimes he'll say different gym. Sometimes he'll say, don't, don't take that appointment. You're gonna get... Sometimes he'll say things like this. There's someone pursuing you, either a meeting with you or something. Be mindful of when I give you a check in your spirit not to take that meeting. And they may dangle some money in front of you. They may dangle some opportunities in front of you. They may dangle some success in front of you. Just be warned, there is a spirit that's trying to manipulate you. So now I don't have to, when I get into that meeting and the Spirit checks me, I don't even have to hesitate as to whether or not to bite on what's being... Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Like God wants to give you a heads up. He wants to give you some warnings. If you will stop reacting to the devil and start focusing on his face. This is where victory starts to be seen in your life. When you're opening up opportunities for the prophetic voice of God to speak. Do y'all remember that story in the Old Testament where, I think it was Elisha, not Ja, but Sha. Everybody say Sha. That one. But there's a war going on, and this bigger, stronger army can't get Israel pinned. And it's because God keeps telling Elisha what they're about to do. And this, this bigger, larger army, I think it was Aram, could not defeat Israel. And the advisor came to the king of Aram and said, you know, sorry to tell you, king, but we can't get these people pinned because they keep predicting every move that we're about to make. The prophet Elisha hears your conversations you're having in your bedroom. Y'all remember that? Like God wants to give you prophetic insight about what the enemy is talking about right now concerning your life. What he's saying about your kids, the strategies that he has for your family and your grandchildren. He wants to give you a heads up. If you'll pause and place yourself with the right thinking. Like, hey, we're not, we're not, we're not the tail here. My enemy's not even the devil. Don't you know he's defeated? Have you read the end of the book? Huh? Like what's keeping me from living the Mark 16 life is not the devil. Do you know what's keeping me from living the Mark 16 life? Me. Me. It's not the devil that needs to be defeated in order for me to live a Mark 16 life. The devil's already defeated. It's me who needs to come into alignment with what God has said and to make space for God. I've got to make space for God in order to live in victory. If I don't make space, all right, so I'll say this. Maybe this will make sense. 
The best teams don't always win. Yes? The strongest militaries don't always win. I'll tell you who usually wins. Those that have the most intelligence. Not intelligence as smart like intel, like we're smart people. No, no, no. They can predict what the other is going to do. They've watched films. They know routines. They know where armies are stationed. They know where weak points are. They have the intel. If you have the intelligence, even though you're weaker, you can still win. Well, here's, here's our deal. God is offering you intelligence, and you're not the weaker. You're actually stronger. You have both. You have the power of God on your side, in you, and you also have at your access his intelligence in the situation. This is, this, this is in the Bible. It's called wisdom <laughs> and knowledge. Like he wants to give you wisdom and knowledge, but your enemy knowing that if you get wisdom and knowledge in partnership with your power and authority, he's done for. Game over. No longer can he torment you. No longer can he take you down. No longer can he take you by surprise. The reason a lot of us fall, the reason a lot of us stumble is because we're taken by surprise. Surprise attack. This takes training. It takes training to live this way. Like it doesn't come naturally. Like you don't get saved and all of a sudden you're like, ooh, I'm going to win. Um, like on, you don't make the decision to be a marathon runner and then wake up the next morning with the ability to run 30, how many miles is a marathon? I don't even know. 26 point, 26 point something. Let's say 27. You don't, listen, I don't make, I don't, I don't lie down tonight. Yeah, I'm a marathon runner. That's what I am. And then crawl out of bed after eating Krispy Kreme and run 27 miles the next day. Does it happen that way? Has anyone ever done that? No, what well, you do? Well, step one, get out of bed. Run a half mile if you can. It starts like, like you start with steps. Yes? So listen, body of Christ, hear me. Good intentions are not obedience. Just because you have in your mind that I am a victorious man of God. I walk in the faith and the power. Just because you've made the decision to be that person doesn't mean that you are. And even though he said it about you, doesn't mean that you're going to start seeing victory until you start training. This is the separation between the name it and claim it and the people who actually walk out the faith. I can't just name stuff and claim stuff. I am a champion. I am a warrior in Christ. Okay, we'll pick up a sword. Do you know how to work it? You're holding the wrong end, sir. <laughs> You're cutting your hand open right now. Right, seriously. All right, Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I discipline my body like an athlete, train it to do what it should. What is he saying? My spirit is alive in Christ. My spirit is in union with God. I would even go as far as to say my spirit is perfect. The spirit part of me. The part where God resides. Is this making sense? Your three parts, your spirit, soul, and body. So what Paul is saying is my spirit is in agreement with Christ. My spirit is the one who's saying, I am a warrior. I am victorious. That's where that's coming. And it's not false. You are. But your body has to be convinced. Your body has to be trained. And your soul has to be actually, actually your soul has to be talked to every day. So this is what he's saying. I've got to train my body. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching, I'm going to be disqualified. All right, so how do people get disqualified in the faith? How do leaders get disqualified? Simple. They don't, they don't train. They don't learn to crucify the flesh and its desires. There's a dead part of you that wants to be resurrected every morning. Every morning. You don't crucify the flesh once. 
You have to crucify the flesh every day. Every day that thing's trying to come back to life. And it's looking for you to resurrect it. For you to feed it. So if there were previous lusts that have been crucified, praise God, but you've got to keep it down because that, that, that old part of you is saying, just one little peak, just one little peak, just one little peak. It's not even bad. Just look, just look, just look. Just look at that picture. Just look at her. Just look at that. Just look at him. Just look. Just one little peak. It's not, it's just a look. It's just a peak. And that's what you say, shut up. You're dead. Shut up. No. Discipline. You got to discipline the body. Jesus had to do this too. It was easy for Jesus. He was God. You think all of that came natural to him? The son of God was placed in a human body that also had to be trained. A lot of people think, well, Jesus didn't even have the ability to sin. What? There cannot be a victory if there is not a possibility to lose. What do you think the scriptures mean when it says that he faced every temptation as we did? If he didn't have the ability to fall to sin, there was no temptation. He had to train. Look where he trained himself, though. In the Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, it says, even though Jesus was God's son, yes, we acknowledge that. Was he completely God? Yes, of course he was. He learned obedience from the things he suffered. All right, learned obedience, what does that mean? When I say, hey, be obedient, we need to learn to be obedient. Immediately, here's where our minds go. We need to learn to do what is right and not do what is wrong. Yes? That is obedience. But Jesus didn't have to learn what is right and what is wrong. Most of us, I would say, don't have to learn what is right and what is wrong. I think learning obedience here, if you break it down, does not mean that he learned to distinguish between right and wrong. This is all about learning to distinguish God's voice from all the other voices. Hey, listen, sometimes obedience is the difference between doing what is right and what is right. What do you mean? Well, it's right for you to drive to work tomorrow. It is right for you to do, you know, Paul says there's a lot of things that I can do. But it's also, it may be right that God says, I want you to stop by McDonald's on your way to work and get coffee. Lord, no one drinks McDonald's coffee. <laughs> this is not the voice of the Lord for my life. This is not, what? Yeah, I want you to stop at that McDonald's on your way to work tomorrow. Is it right to drive to work? Yes. yes. Yes? But there's also another right thing in the moment. This is the prophetic voice of God that says, I have an assignment for you on your way to work if you choose to obey me. Well, I, I might be late. Okay. Drive through or dine in? Drive through. Praise God. All right, thank you. What are we going to do? I'll tell you when you get there. Ooh. <laughs> Drive through window. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. What can I take your order? I would like a cup of coffee. Yes, cup of coffee. <laughs> Great. Pull up to the next window. Next window. Here's your coffee, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Meh. I've had better. Uh-oh. Open door. There we go. Ma'am, I know that there's several cars behind me. If I could pray for you in 20 seconds, how would I do that? I'm about to drive off and pray. How would I pray for you? Well, I just got some really bad news about my health, and I'm struggling. Can I have your hand real quick, ma'am? Huh? I want to pray for you really quick, ma'am. In the name of Jesus, I bless this woman. I pray that the power of God fall upon her. I pray, God, that your healing power fall upon her. I pray that more so you bless her with your peace right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, ma'am. Be looking for God in your life. Boom. Off we go. Off we go. This is learning obedience, is it not? 
it, it's like, get out of your head that my life is about just staying in this lane all day. <laughs> Blocking the devil. Oh, don't look at that billboard. Ah, don't look at that. Oh, don't look at her. Oh, don't say that. Ah, just trying. Like this, this life is throwing junk at you all day, yes? And uh, so many Christians are just like, ah. Ah. Oh, 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 ah. Just got to make it back to church on Sunday, man. But when you know you have an assignment, here's what I've, here, listen, this is what I've noticed. A lot of the temptation goes away when you know where you're going every day. Like I'm looking at a destination. I've got assignments. Yeah, get out of my way. Get out of my way. Bye, bye, bye. You're, 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 I don't even, that didn't bother me anymore. Like it don't bother me. Because there's a greater fulfillment. My fulfillment in life is not just making it through the day. My fulfillment in life is walking in step with the Holy Spirit on this adventure of knowing God more fully and actually doing stuff. Are y'all hearing this? There's a better way to live. So much, but it takes learned obedience. You know, the disciples who were the best at everything, while they were walking the earth with Jesus, Jesus was the best, obviously, but outside of Jesus, they were experts. They were the, the, the leading experts on healing and deliverance and everything. In Mark chapter 9, we'll close with this. Mark chapter 9 Jesus is coming off the Mount of Transfiguration. And the other disciples are at the bottom of the hill trying to cast the devil out of a boy. Man brought this boy to Jesus. Disciples who had been 100% up to this point couldn't get this one out. And they're trying. I imagine, I've, I've seen what frantic deliverance looks like. <laughs> I imagine they're probably raising their voices. Get a Bible. You know, we didn't exist then, but get a scroll. <laughs> Hit him with a scroll. <laughs> Throw some water in his face. Ah! You know, they probably weren't making the cross yet, either. They didn't mean anything other than death. So uh, whatever they were doing, you know, they were, they were doing it. I've seen frantic deliverance. I've done frantic deliverance. They can't get it out. Up walks Jesus. And they're like, uh, we just, you know, and he says, what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? What? Wait, wait, put that down. Don't hit him with that. Bad idea. What are y'all doing? And the father steps up and says, yeah, I brought him, I brought my child to your disciples. They couldn't get the devil out. He's, how long has he been this way? Since birth. And he says two things. He, he, he's talking to the disciples. He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long do I have to put up with you? You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long do I have to put up with you? And then he cast the devil out. The disciples came to him in private. Good idea. He says, uh, how are you today? Good to see you. How was the mount? Were you, heard it was nice. You know, probably some jealousy too. Well, I'm glad y'all you, had a good time up there on the mountain while we doing deliverance down here. Why could we not cast it out? And note what he says. He, he, he didn't say, you win some and you lose some. He, did, he didn't give the response that a lot of church people give. He, he didn't say, well, I'm God and you're not. He didn't say, sometimes you just got to deal with this. Sometimes people just have to suffer through things and you just need to accept it. Jesus never gave people a Hallmark card. Huh? Ever. He didn't say, well, a day's coming where this stuff's not going to happen anymore anyway, and so y'all just need to get ready for it. <laughs> he, did, he didn't say, um, well, when you were praying, the boy didn't have enough faith. It's not on the boy's end. Why could we not? See, they had learned, they had learned not to accept defeat. Yes? 
And we've got to be careful with this because often we'll try to blame us or blame others. If it's not on God's end, then it's on our end somehow. And, and you'll, you'll get into what I call shame and guilt. You don't get in shame and guilt. You don't cooperate with that spirit, but you don't cooperate with the spirit of defeat. You learn. You ask questions like, God, why couldn't we get this? I know it's your will. Why couldn't we get this devil out? And he said, this kind only go out by praying and fasting. All right, so this is where we end. We'll pick up next week right here. This is what he said. He didn't step aside and go pray and fast. Because that's sometimes what prayer and fasting feels like. I'm pulling on God. I know something's getting in here. I'm starving to death. This is horrible. <laughs> something's happening. He didn't go over there and oh, 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 muster something out and ah, out in Jesus' name. Out in my name. <laughs> What, what is he saying here? This is what he's teaching them. He's not, he's not actually even pointing them to a discipline. He's pointing them to a lifestyle. He says, this is the way I live. I live in such a way. Remember, what's the problem? Unbelieving and perverse. Unbelieving. You're not close enough to God. Perverse. You're too close to this world. What's the solution? Praying. Getting closer to God. Fasting. Getting farther from the world. Jesus said, I'm living in this rhythm every day where I'm telling the flesh no and I'm opening up conversation with God. I pray without cease. I'm talking to God all day so that when a situation is presented before me, either I already know what to do because he's warned me about it or he's going to tell me in the moment of exactly what to do. I'm not going to be persuaded or or distracted by the world because I've just, I've, 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 kill, I've killed it. <laughs> you know, it's easy to know if you've got some flesh still living because it, it talks. Like if you're in offense or unforgiveness, it's only because that's a part of you that hadn't died yet. You can't offend a dead person. So Jesus says, I, I live this lifestyle of constant separation from the world. And, and we would see him do this. He gets news that John the Baptist is beheaded. What's the first step? He goes to be alone with Jesus or to be alone with the Father. He goes, he goes to the prayer. Uh, he, he would go up to the mountain before a day of ministry and spend all night with God. Are y'all seeing this? Like the key to victory is not just claiming certain things in Jesus' name. It's actually walking in a rhythm of praying beholding him, knowing him, talking to him, getting information from him that he wants to give, not pulling on him to do certain things, asking him, what do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go? How do you, are y'all seeing this? This is, this is this relationship. Paul says, I want you to have this relationship where you get to know God. And in the middle of the relationship, two things are going to happen. You're going to see how good he is and everything else is going to become garbage. It's going to be easy for you to say, get out of here. This is a waste. I don't need Netflix. I don't need three hours of Facebook a day. You know, it's one thing to do it just out of, oh. But if you're beholding someone and he's worth more than that, things just start to fall off. You're going to get in this rhythm, and all of a sudden, you're going to see substance start to flow in and through your life. And even the strong men, the ones that only come out by praying and fasting, they're going to start falling. Giants are going to start falling. But you got to train. you got to want this. You can make it all the way to heaven without it. But here's my question. Why would you just want to limp into heaven rather than experience everything that God died to give you? Why don't you stand up? The verse I didn't get to is a um, passage where um, Jesus is about to be crucified and he tells his disciples, stay awake and pray with me. And um, they fall asleep. He comes back and they're asleep. And he says something really profound. He, he says, watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. 
for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right, so that word for willing, I looked it up, that word for willing, spirit is willing. It doesn't mean like, well, I'm willing if you want to, because that's kind of how we interpret willing. Like, hey, you want to go out to eat later? I'm willing. Just say no if you don't want to, you know? I mean, willing is not a word that we use that, that would, would be described as a passionate desire. But actually, if you translate the word, it is an eager pursuit or passionate desire. All right, so willingness there is not just, um, you know, sometimes I'm sitting on the couch and I want some food, but I don't want it bad enough to actually get up and go get it. Anybody ever been there? But if I hear somebody in the kitchen who says, hey, can I bring you anything? I'm like, well, yes, you can. I'm willing to eat the food that you bring to me. A lot of times in the body of Christ, that's the kind of willing that we have. I'll eat if you bring it to me. Like you were willing this morning to hear what I said and maybe even chew on some of the things. But are you willing? I'm not being prideful or boastful, but this, this took about 20 hours to get this in the form that I could put it on a plate and bring it to you. Are you willing to come after the Lord in a similar way to get similar revelation and get insight for your life? Like he wants to tell, he told me something this week for all of us. He, wants, he also told me some things this week for just me. He gave me some insight for just me. He wants to give you the same. Are you willing to get out of the chair and actually go get the food for yourself this week? Man, he wants you to. He wants you to. You know, for a season, he'll bring it to the couch because he loves you. And he wants to get, you, get a taste. Like today, you got a taste. Are you willing to wake up tomorrow morning a little bit early and go get something that he's got? He's got a table prepared for you in the, in the presence of your enemy. And we're not going to focus on the enemy. The enemy's going to have to focus on us eating. He's going to be forced to watch you dine with God. And he's going to be pacing all around you going, oh, no. They're getting some information. God's talking to them. This is not good. Let's make the enemy nervous this week. Let's make him respond to us this week as we dine with God. As we dine with God you to bow your heads. I'm going to give a unique invitation this morning. Don't usually do this, but if you want this, if you want this victorious life, you want prophetic insight, you want to go deeper in your relationship with the Lord, I want you to just come down to this altar. I'm going to pray a prayer over you, but I do want you to move. I don't want you to just sit there, and if you don't come, it's fine. It's fine. I understand, but I do believe God's given people an opportunity to move in faith. I'm just going to pray a prayer over you. And I do believe that in this moment, some apathy is going to be knocked off of you. Maybe, maybe even some situations, I think some pesky little spirits that have been harassing you are going to be knocked off of you. You're going to get some clarity. I think that sound mind that we sang about is going to come to you. But it is your responsibility to steward this. Tomorrow, you got to wake up and start training. Are y'all hear what I'm saying? Like if you got to start training... You can't just expect God to make deposits while you sleep. You've got to open your Bible. You've got to get before the Lord. You've got to press into Him. You've got to become silent and listen for His voice. You've got to get through the breakthrough. There's going to be some breakthrough at some point, but you've got to contend for it. Training is not one day. Seasons of training. Seasons of training. So just open your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want this life. We want victory. We want assignments. We want prophetic insight. We want to be the head, not the tail. We want to be the spear, not the shield. We want to step into the assignment that you have for our lives, God. There's a community that needs Jesus Send us out like warriors. Send us out like athletes. Send us out like victors. And train us in the process. Train us to hear your voice. Train us to love our time with you. Teach us to train our bodies. To tell our bodies no. To tell our minds, get in alignment with the word of God. Quit thinking that. 
Take captive every thought. Make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Teach us to train, God. Teach us to train. I bind the spirit of apathy right now in Jesus' name. I bind the spirit of complacency in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you release fresh hunger. Fresh hunger, new hunger, and even greater hunger than the day that they were saved. This is a season of transition. This is a season of promotion. Yes. Receive your promotion. Yes, God. And now train for it. Train for it. The upcoming year will require sound thinking, God thinking. Troops are needed. So I just pray a blessing over them, God. Make deposits, strengthen them, love on them. In Jesus' name.